this, what I was covering, um, what I thought I'd briefly cover is what an audiologist is. So we are an allied health professional, uh, like a physio or optometrist, and we're hearing specialists. Part of our role is um, to assess hearing, so clearly. Uh, we also do balance tests for dizziness and vertigo, tinnitus assessments and treatment, and part of assessing hearing is also he managing hearing loss with hearing aids or uh, cochlear implants or Bajas, and Dr Biggs has discussed cochlear implants and Bajas, and Bruce is discussing hearing aids later on. So as Dr Biggs covered, there's many different causes of hearing loss. There's two main types, conductive hearing loss or sensory neural hearing loss. And a conductive hearing loss is essentially a mechanical problem, so something physically stopping the sound getting through to the cochlea, and that can be something like otosclerosis, which is what um, Mr Howard was talking about earlier, exostoses, atresia or infection. And sensory neural hearing loss is um, more damage to the cochlea or the nerve, uh, which can be presbycusis, which is more age-related, noise exposure, uh, Meniere's disease or ototoxic drugs, so drugs that are toxic to the cochlea. So when we assess hearing loss, it's not just a audiogram, there's also really important that we take um, a patient histories, which can include things like how you perceive your hearing, because audiogram tells us part of the story, but also how you, how, where you feel you're having difficulty can also affect um, what intervention we look at. Uh, whether you have a family history of hearing loss, uh, if you have any difficulty with your balance, um, uh, any vertigo or um, vertigo attacks or dizziness, um, if you've had any recent head injuries, uh, in history of infections, tinnitus and um, in some situations what medications you're on can be relevant. So when we do a hearing assessment there's normally three components. The first component is an audiogram which is a hearing test. We do some speech recognition testing and we also do impedance testing which tells us how well your middle ear is functioning. And there's two parts of that. First part is called a tympanogram which measures how well your eardrum moves in response to a pressure change. And the second part is acoustic reflexes that looks at the reflex pathway which I know Sarah was discussing a little bit in her tinnitus talk. So what is an audiogram? What we're looking to measure with an audiogram is to determine the softest sound that you can hear across many different pitches in each ear. Our ears can hear from 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz and a standard audiogram looks at between 250 hertz up to 8,000 hertz. In some situations they may, be, um, may test to high frequencies up to 14,000. The reason we test between 250 and 8,000 kilo, uh, 8,000 hertz is because this is where majority of speech lies. So in terms of how we manage it for hearing aids or other circumstances, we, speech is our priority, so we need to know how, you're he how well you're picking up speech. The other element I is how loud the sound is, so that determines at each level what, how, how, well, um, how loud the sound is. It's much clearer on this. So, down the side here is how loud the sounds are. So the top is very quiet and the bottom here is very loud. And across the bottom here is the pitch or the tone, what's also known as the frequency. And at this end is low pitch sounds like a bus, for example. And up the higher end is, the, sorry, up the other end is the high pitch tones, such as birds or in terms of speech, the lower of tones down here, up this end here, this is the volume of speech or the vowel sounds. And up this area here is the high pitch tones, which is the consonants or the clarity of speech. Now the red line which you can see in the middle, across there, that indicates above that line is where normal hearing lies. Below that line is where there's a hearing loss present. Now. The reason we do an audiogram, because sometimes we're asked um, exactly why this is relevant to real life situations, well this gives us a comparative measure and it's a standardised measure of hearing. So it means that from, the, from that information, uh, particular shapes of hearing loss give us an inf idea of what sounds you're missing and then also the implications of that hearing loss. So for example, um, we know that if you're missing the higher pitch tones, often you'll be fine one-on-one, -on -one, but you might have more difficulty as soon as it's a difficult situation. So there's some distance 
or a lot of background noise around, it's a different, um, it's a different comparison basically. It gives us an idea. There are other ways to assess hearing. So with the audiogram, that's the gold standard and that's widely what's used. For different situations, we may also do what's known as an ABR, an auditory brainstem response, and that um, is another clinical test we can use. And for children, we use quite different tests. So we might use something known as VROA or play audiometry. And it's looking, it's the same concept as what we're after is a response in response to a sound, but it's age appropriate so that we can obtain as much information as possible. We also will do some assessments um, with hearing aids in, so to determine what benefit the hearing aids are giving you while you're wearing them. So it can be a speech in noise, so we do some speech tests in noise often, or sometimes an aided audiogram as well. There we go. <laughs> so on this screen is audiograms for the left ear and the right ear. Okay, so the left ear is always blue in audiology and the right ear is always red. So red for right and they start with R. So just to give you an idea, uh, I've drawn on here normal hearing. So age related hearing loss is called presbycusis and normally we see that that affects the high tones so we might see an audiogram something like this and in some situations it can drop down a little bit further more like the left ear and often it gradually progresses over time so the left ear is a little bit more severe than the right ear so with the, this is what we commonly see um, with age-related hearing loss. And on the, um, on the audiogram here, you can see the sounds that you'd be missing as a lot of the consonant sounds like sh and f and s. They're all missing in particular in the left ear and some of them are also missing in the right ear as well. Now, if we bring this back up. Now, when you have noise exposure like what David was talking about, often it looks long term eventually very similar to presbycusis, but at the start we often see hearing well within normal limits. Um, there we go. So we'll just look at the left ear here. So hearing is well within normal limits in the low pitch tones here. And you can see it recovers in the very high pitch tones, but we get this nice notch, especially around 4K. Um, which is a result of noise. So this is when we first start to see the damage as a result of noise. Now, as Dr. Biggs was talking about before with cochlear implants, we're now starting to see that cochlear implants can be fitted from 70 and below. So often the criteria aren't quite as strict as a set audiogram. It's very much about the benefit um, you're currently getting from hearing aids. Uh, if your hearing aids are no longer effective, then a cochlear implant may well be an option. So looking at something below 70 flat loss or 80 or 90, uh, once you're below 90, a cochlear implant's a definite serious option. The other, um, another type of hearing loss is something like Meniere's disease, which I'm not sure how many um, have you have heard of that? And what we typically see with Meniere's is a low frequency hearing loss like this. So it's the opposite of what we normally see with um, presbycusis where we normally see the high, high pitch tones are really good, but there's a hearing loss in the lower pitch tones. So this is quite typical of what, what we would expect to see with someone being diagnosed with Meniere's. And often it fluctuates. So they may have good days where um, it's up closer to normal limits and they might find that on bad days it comes down here a bit further. The other type of hearing loss that you may, we do see, I'll just draw this one on here. So this hearing loss is more um, what we would see that's typical of more a congenital hearing loss. It's more, um, we can get a bit of low pitch or high pitch tone hearing loss. We can also get the opposite way, a bit more. Sorry about this. We can also get quite a few different configurations, which give us some indication that you're more likely to have had a hearing loss for quite a long time. So you may not realise, you may feel like your hearing is, um, hasn't changed and it's only other people who are noticing. And if you've had that for an extended period of time, that's not surprising. Now, so that we don't run too over time, I'm going to leave it there and pass over to Bruce and he can continue on about hearing aids. So we'll swap back.